Can't start without my pencil. Well, good morning to you. Wishing you all a wonderful day in the Lord. And we are most gracious to our Heavenly Father for giving us another day of life. His grace is immeasurable. His love without calculation. His promises are ever faithful. His goodness, there's no way to measure God's goodness in our life. He gives, he gives, he's ever patient, ever merciful. And despite all our unfaithfulness, despite all our failures, despite myself being riddled with every possible idiosyncrasy, God is faithful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen. We're so excited to join together today in our devotions and start today with Jesus. I want to welcome this morning Nora. May God richly bless you. I want to welcome this morning Carl. May God bless you also. And also want to Bless this morning, Mary, and thank you for joining us this morning. May God richly bless you in every possible way. We know that God's word is the inerrant, infallible word of God. It's inspired. Men have tried to take the Bible apart grammatically. They failed. They tried to take the Bible apart historically, and they failed. They tried to take the, the Bible apart scientifically, and they failed. And they tried to take the Word of God apart from a business point of view by creating multitudes of publishing companies. We have the X version, the Y version, the AB version, the 1-2 version of, of the New Testament and the Old Testament. But God's word, heaven and earth will pass away. But not one comma, not one dot will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word shall never pass away. Good morning, beloved Connie, woman of God, woman of prayer, woman of spiritual principles. And blessings to your wonderful husband, the evangelist, the psalmist. We welcome you. We're so excited again to join together around God's word. You know, many people join around liquor. Many people join around drugs. Many people gather around just to go see a movie in the cinema. Nothing better than to gather around God's word. Good morning, Catherine. You know, we have so many healers. We have so many healers in our group. We have so many doctors, Dr. Ibrahim, Dr. Christoph Sahar. We have so many, Dr. Natalie. We have so many healers and we have so many men and women of God who are so gifted. We're so blessed in our group. We have such a gifted group. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. So I'm going to ask Tiger Joe to open us in a word of prayer. And we're going to get started on a very interesting message that has challenged my heart, that has opened my heart and my eyes. And I know that it will do the same for you. So we ask Tiger Joe to bring us to the Lord in prayer, that God will bless us, that God will anoint us, God would pour his Holy Spirit upon us and fill us, that we would decrease and that God would increase and that we would feed on God's word because Jesus is the bread of life. Good morning, Sandy. Great to have you on board. Great to have you on board. And so we just thank the Lord. 
If you feel if you feel the impulse this morning by the Holy Spirit to say praise the Lord, type in praise the Lord. If you feel the impulse this morning to say thank you, Jesus, type in thank you, Jesus. Our God is a conversational God. He likes us to talk to him and he loves talking to us. So all of you this morning, if you feel like saying something to Jesus, type it in. Express yourself. Amen. 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 So we're going to get started now with the topic of Philip. Thank you, Tiger Joe. And God certainly will answer that prayer and keep us safe and fill us with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So did you know in the Bible that there are two Philips? There are two Philips. In the Gospel of John, chapter 143, we see Philip being called by Jesus to be a disciple. We know that Philip was a inhabitant of the city of Bethsaida, just as Andrew and Peter were. We know that Philip was a disciple of John the Baptist. And it was then when John said, behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. That's when John the Baptist pointed to Jesus. And Philip followed after the Lord. We know that Philip is a person who is very sanguine. He is so happy. He met the Lord. And what does he do when he meets the Lord? He goes right away to, to bring Nathaniel to meet the Lord as well. Julieta, good morning to you. And we love you very much. So you see the sanguine personality. The sanguine personality is so happy in the Lord when that, when, that when they learn a new truth, that when they meet Jesus, they want to share with you right away. May we be the same way. We see that Philip also attended the wedding at Cana. It seemed like Jesus and Mary and all the disciples were invited to this wonderful wedding, the wedding in Cana, John chapter 2. And if you haven't been there, it's a beautiful street. It's probably about, probably about four or five houses on that street. And one of those houses, it's probably the houses, one of those houses is the house of the wedding. So if you ever get a chance or if you ever want to join my wife and I and, and, my, and my mom and my kids, and we'll give you a wonderful tour of the Holy Land, you let us know and we'll take you there. Philip asks, Philip is a person Philip the Apostle is someone who asks questions. Asking questions is very important. He asked Jesus, how do we feed the 5,000 people? We also know that Philip has a Greek name. More than likely, Philip spoke Greek. And he probably knew a lot of Greek pilgrims who came to Jesus. He was part of the Greek community. My friends, God has placed you in a certain place and time for a reason. Use it for God's glory. That's something that's coming to me through the Holy Spirit. And it's Philip who advises Andrew and tells Jesus that there are certain Greeks. This is in John 12, 21, that there are certain Greeks who want to meet Jesus. And so you see, my friends, we are all in contact with people. And it's our responsibility and our duty and obligation to bring them to Jesus. Good morning, Stephen. And again, another question that Philip, that Philip the Apostle asks at the Last Supper, he says, Father, he said, no, I'm sorry, rather said, Jesus, show us the Father. Show us the Father. You know, there is no question that, that God will not listen to and bend down and hear. And this question from Philip gave Jesus the opportunity to show and teach the, the Apostles the unity of the Father and the Son. But we cannot and should not confuse Philip the Apostle with Philip the Evangelist. Did you know there were two Philips? Most Christians don't know that. There was Philip the Apostle and Philip the Evangelist. You see, there was, a, there was an argument in the early church. The widows, many of them were true Jewish women. And there were Jewish women that were of Greek culture. And every morning they came to the apostles. They came to the church. They had needs. They needed food. They needed clothing. They needed provision. 
They needed money. And they began to argue with each other and saying, well, you're getting more than I'm getting. And I'm, 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 authentic, I'm authentically Jewish and you're Jewish by, by name, but you're practicing Greek culture. And there, was, and there was division, there was controversy in the church. And I, and I tell you something that's very important, that the Bible is so honest. The Bible is so raw. The Bible is the unvarnished word of God because it shows real problems and real solutions that God wants us to see and to learn from. You know, the Bible reveals intimate conversations. Listen to the, listen to the prayers and conversations of Abraham between God and himself. Moses and God, David and God, Daniel and God, Elijah and God. The Bible is real and shows us that God wants us to have conversations with him. And the Bible also shows us the mountaintops of godly men, but also shows us the valleys of these, of these godly men. So this dispute, this argument, this prejudice that was going on, regarding the, the daily provisions, the apostles said to themselves, we ought not to be involved in this. We need to be dedicated to prayer and preaching of the word. And I want you to notice here, they didn't vote for deacons. They fasted, they prayed, and they laid hands on, and they chose seven godly men. This is something that the church needs to learn today about choosing godly deacons. It is not a democratic process. The ordination of men to preach the word of God, whether as biblical evangelists, preachers, and teachers, is not a voting or democratic process. It is a process of the Holy Spirit. And we see that the apostles set time aside to fast, pray, and lay hands on them and to pray for them. And they chose seven godly men. Now, one of those men was Stephen. And Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. And he was filled with the strength of the Lord. And these seven men, and Philip the Evangelist was one of them, these seven men were specified to take care of the widows. And so they had the gift of mercy. They had the gift of, of administration. They had the gift of leadership. They had the, the gift of giving. My friends, there are many gifts in the Holy Spirit. Whatever gift you have, praise the Lord for it and use it. We see that in, in chapter 6. Now, after the, the death of Stephen, which we're going to review tomorrow, so don't miss it. It's my birthday, and you don't want to miss this beautiful message on Stephen. But after the death of Stephen, great persecution came on the church. And everyone was scattered. The men of God left Jerusalem, but they continued to preach the word of God. I'm saying to you in the Holy Spirit, when greater tribulations come our way, when testings are going to be coming our way, when the things of the future that are predicted in Revelation are coming down the pike, we may be scattered, but we're going to be scattered for good reason to preach the word of God. You heard it here. Do not stop teaching Jesus and do not stop preaching Jesus crucified. And so Philip goes to Samaria of all places the Samaritans were not the most loved people. And in Acts chapter 8, we read here, I'm starting from verse 3, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and they made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made great havoc of the church, entering every house. He was entering every Christian's house, and arresting men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, they went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. That should be our response. You know, the church can be attacked from the outside through persecution, 
or the church can be attacked from, from within through deception. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. What did he do? Well, he did some life coaching. No. Uh, he went there to encourage people. No. He went there to preach social prosperity. No. He went to teach Christian parapsychology. No. It says he went there and he preached Christ. My friends, when you're talking about the gospel, please make it simple. Please make the gospel simple. Preach Christ. Look what it says here in response. And the people, with one accord, the whole entire town of Samaria, they gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing. They were hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And I'm going to pause here for a moment. I'm going to have to ask you a very unorthodox question. It's uncouth. Was Philip the evangelist an apostle? You know the answer. Was Philip the evangelist a disciple of the Lord? Was he one of the original disciples of the Lord? What is he doing here in chapter 8? Doing miracles. He's preach, He's evangelizing. He was originally chosen as a deacon to administer, to, to be a leader, to be a giver, to show mercy. And all of a sudden now the church is under stress. And now he realizes he has the gift to heal, and he is an evangelist. My friends, what is he doing here? He is obeying the Lord. He's making himself available to the Holy Spirit for unclean spirits. You know, today in today's world, unfortunately, we're too we're too septic. We're too we're too we're too off the mark. We think everything is a disease. There are people today who are possessed by the devil. There are people who are sick because they are oppressed by Satan. Please, Christians, know your Bibles. Not everything can be cleaned or, or, or taken care of at a hospital. There are things that there are there are things that there is no medicine for, only the word of God, only fasting and prayer, and only the mercy of God. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice, coming out of many that were possessed. There were people that were possessed then, and there are people who are possessed today. And many that had the palsy, and many that were lame were healed. So we see that he has the power, that, that God has given Philip the evangelist, Philip the deacon, the gift of exorcism healing, evangelism, besides the other gifts. My friends, God does not only give sometimes one gift. He may give you many gifts. And if you pray for gifts, he will give you extra gifts. That's the kind of God that we have. Now, if that wasn't enough, he meets a man from Ethiopia who is like the key man in Ethiopia. God has just told the apostles, preach the word Everywhere. Preach the gospel everywhere. And so he meets this very important Ethiopian man. This, this meeting is not by chance. It's not by happen chance. My friends, please take this from the Holy Spirit. The people you meet and the things that you have the, th the things that happen in your life are divine appointments. Take them as such, use them as such, and God's going to bless you. Acts 8:26. And the angel of the Lord, you hear that? That's pretty awesome. And the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip. My friends, I pray that we are, we are available to hear God's voice. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, <coughs> excuse me, saying, arise and go. A lot of time God tells us to arise and go. We stay in the couch. Arise and go toward the south unto the way, going down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. I've been to both places, both very beautiful places, but a very long, treacherous road. And, and the angel of the Lord is telling to arise and go. And if God is telling you to arise and go, go. 
And he arose and went. What does that show? That shows that he had immediate, complete, full obedience to the word of God. My friends, when the Holy Spirit is talking to you, listen. When God is speaking to you, obey. When the Holy Spirit is prompting your heart to send some money to someone, when the Holy Spirit is prompting you to go to the hospital and to visit someone, when the Holy Spirit is prompting you to pray, obey. Now, immediate, go, 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 now, 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 do, do, do. That's what's missing in the church today. There's what's called spiritual procrastination. God doesn't like that. God wants full, immediate obedience. And on the way he, be, he beheld, he met a man from Ethiopia of great authority. He ends up being the treasurer of the country of Ethiopia. And the reason why he came to Jerusalem was to worship. You see, God says, if you draw, no, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And so God responds to this man because he's trying to come to, to, to Jerusalem to worship God. He doesn't know God, not yet. And God's going to draw near to him. And as he was returning and sitting in the chariot, he was reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Now notice here in verse 29. Then the spirit said unto Philip, you see, we need to learn to be sensitive to, Holy, to the Holy Spirit. If you're always listening to the iPhone, if you're always playing with your, your smartphone, if you're always watching television, if you're always gossiping, if you're always busy at work, if, you're always, if, you, if your mind is not on the Holy Spirit, you're not going to get these sensations. You're not going to get these intimations. You're not going to get this, this, this sensitivity that you need to hear the qualified voice of the Holy Spirit. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Take that seriously. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and join thyself to the chariot. What does it say? And Philip walked. No. Philip thought about it. No. Philip skipped. No. It says, and Philip ran. You see how he obeys the Spirit of God. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read from the prophet Isaiah. He's asked a question. My friends, it's very important for us as Christians to stop being so dogmatic and barking at people and, 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 and being so harsh on other people. We, learned, we need to learn to be like Jesus and ask questions. He says, do you understand what you're reading? That's a fair question. And he gets a fair answer. He goes, how can I understand that until, unless someone guides me? How can I understand unless someone teaches me? And he invited Philip into the chariot. And the place where he was reading was no coincidence. He was reading something very prophetic in the book of Isaiah where it says, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who can declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Now another question. The eunuch asks him, I pray thee, of whom does the prophet speak? Of himself or of some other man? And this is where we fail sometimes as Christians. We need to learn to open our mouths. you got to forget about this cancel culture. You need to learn to open your mouth, open it wide, speak the truth, speak the truth. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the scriptures, and he, and he preached unto him Christian parapsychology. No. He taught him the doxology. No. He preached unto him Jesus. You see what's happening here? When, when we're sensitive to the angel of the Lord, when we're sensitive to the Spirit of God, when we're sensitive to the Spirit, and we're preaching Christ, and we're fully obedient, we're going to get the opportunity to preach Christ crucified and preach Christ Jesus. And as they went on their way, verse 36, they saw certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's some water. What will hinder me from being baptized? Now, I'm going to flip out here for a minute, so bear with me. 
How dare these publication companies who are making money selling Bibles and putting apps on phone, taking out verse 37. If you go to the Septuagint, it's there. I don't know what liberal, progressive, idiotic theologian who's trying to think that they can they can vet and edit the New Testament and take out verse 37. God gives a very clear warning not to add or subtract from the word of God. And I speak as a man of God, appointed by God to be a watchman. Beware. Beware of the Bibles you read. This is missing in many Bibles. Verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if it's not in your Bible, if this verse 37 is not in your Bible, throw your Bible in the garbage, or at least be enlightened enough to understand that man is being used as is being used as instruments of Satan to take out very important doctrine out from the Bible. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. He went down. They both got baptized. They were both in the water. And when and when Philip came out, it says in verse 39, the spirit of the Lord came. Just a light like Elijah. The spirit of the Lord came down and caught away Philip. And the eunuch saw him no more and was rejoicing. One of the things that Christians need to learn, especially those who are ministering the word, the three B's. When I got ordained, the first thing I learned, the number one thing I learned, the three B's. Be on time, be brief, and then be gone. This We see this in the life of Philip. And we see Philip later. God takes him to, God takes him in the spirit to another place called, called Azotus. And he continues preaching all the way until he comes to Caesarea. And later on, Acts 21, Paul gets to meet Philip. Now he's called Philip the Evangelist. And he has four daughters. And they're all virgins. They're all pure. They're devoted to the Lord. Sometimes our work as Christians is not the mission field, but raising godly children in each of these four girls. They knew how to prophesy. Now, I'm going to end with some questions. And that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to end with these questions, and, and there ended the lesson. Question number one we have to ask ourselves. And before I ask these questions, I'm going to insist that whatever I ever preach on this channel, I'm challenging you, and I commend you in the Holy Spirit to double-check everything I say. If it is not verified in the Word of God, if it is not verified in the Old and New Testament, then, then take what I say and, and throw it in the garbage. But if what I say is found in the Word of God, then I am no longer responsible for what I said, and the responsibility is upon you. There is something today in liberal, progressive theology that's called cessationism. It is the idea that miracles and, and miraculous gifts and signs have ceased, that when the last apostle died, there are no more miracles done through human beings. I don't happen to believe that. And the reason why I say that is that Stephen also did miracles and signs, and so did Philip. And so here, here's the question I have to ask. Why do we see as the book of Acts continues that signs and wonders begin to wane? Miracles begin to wane. We see it very early on in the beginning of Acts as the book of Acts continues, miracles and signs and wonders and healings begin to wane. What is the reason for that? I'm going to give you my answer to this. Matthew 6, 24. No one, no one, again, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. 
We see it that as the church has progressed through time, pastors are more concerned about their salary, their time off, their benefits, rather than feeding the sheep. The church has become too consumed with capitalism, becoming rich. In the early church, the saints took all their money, they sold all their possessions, and they, they threw it at the apostles' feet. My friends, one of the reasons why we have lost our power in the church is that we have replaced our love and devotion and worship for the Lord with material goods. And the Bible is very clear that when we do that, we pierce ourselves with many sufferings. I think Philip is a wonderful example that God can use anyone. God can use a pastor. God can use a deacon. God can use me. And God can use you. What are your gifts? What are the gifts that God has given to you through the Holy Spirit? Are you being sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Are you listening to the angel of the Lord? Are you being sensitive to the Spirit? Are you willing to go and preach? Are you willing to arise and to go? The world more than ever needs Christians that are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, who are willing to be obedient, and they don't care about money. They only care about pleasing the Lord. May the Lord richly bless you today. I pray that this talk today about Philip was an eye-opening experience for us to realize that God loves the Philips of the world today. Now allow me to be the first person to wish Philip Uda, Bishop Philip Uda, whose birthday also is tomorrow, happy birthday, blessed wishes to you, and to all of you who joined me this morning, may God richly bless you, healing and blessing and grace is coming to you ask believe and receive ask believe and receive i want to say it again ask do not be double-minded if you're double-minded you will receive nothing ask believe and receive and have thanksgiving and look forward to your prayers being answered Simply just wait on the Lord. Be encouraged. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not with your mind. May God richly bless you. And if the Lord tarries, we'll see you tomorrow as we study the wonderful life of Stephen at 8.30 tomorrow morning if the Lord tarries. May God richly bless you. Amen.